All right, folks, thanks for tuning back into People, Passion, and Power with Jason Martin. Super fun guest today, one of my basketball playing partners. We play together on Monday and Friday. This guy has game, I promise you that. He is the director of the D.C. Department of Energy and the Environment, Mr. Tommy Wells. Thanks for coming on the show. You bet, Jason. Honored that you asked. That's a very, uh, very big title. I just like to call you my basketball buddy. Is that okay? That's fine. I'm very, I'm just as proud as um, being on the basketball court as I am being your director of the Department of Energy and the Environment. We like to talk to people um, about their passions, their career paths, just get to know local people. So we were studying you, and I know you, we do play a couple times a week, but um, University of Minnesota, Catholic, uh, from Austin, Texas, you bounced around a lot, like in a, in a good way. Talk me through that. Well, I mostly grew up actually just outside of Birmingham in Alabama. I was, my dad was in the ministry for a little while and he um, went to school in Austin, Texas at the university there and then that's where I was born. And then um, essentially grew up in Alabama, went to the University of Alabama and then for graduate school, as you know, I went first to University of Minnesota, got a master's in social work and then I um, came here and went to law school at Catholic University. And most of your career, you were in public service. That's right. Is, was that by design for you? Well, you know, initially I thought I was going to be a therapist for adolescents and families. And that's what I did at the University of Minnesota. And I came to Washington. I was not that interested in politics. But after going to the University of Minnesota, I knew that Minnesota was too cold. I wasn't going to live there. and. I felt like um, I wanted a greater challenge than going back to Birmingham. And so I went into a professor's office and I'd say, and I thought very highly of the gentleman, and I said, where would you go, um, Dr. Schwartz? And he said, I would go to Washington, D.C. He had worked for Jimmy Carter. He said, go to Washington. So I went home, sold my car for a train ticket, came up here on an overnight train, the Crescent, and came out at Union Station, fell in love with the city, and, um, and I've been here ever since. That was 1983. And so I got a job working in, um, for the city as a child protection social worker with adolescents. It was a time when the city was broke. It was the late 80s. It, or that's when um, I kind of got fully into my career. It was about 85, then into the late 80s. But also that was the advent of crack and something called HIV, AIDS, that people didn't know where it came from. And so the city was really... Um, a very difficult spot for children and families, for poor people in the city in particular. And it was, um, you know, it, things were pretty bad. People were leaving the city as fast as they could, and the city was broke. And so I um, went to law school at night and decided I'd be part of the change of, um, of trying to, I got more interested in systemic reform than helping people one at a time. And that's really been kind of, you know, in public service, but it was very frustrating working with individuals, seeing the same things happen over and over again. We had no foster families for any kids that may have been born to families that were affected by HIV or AIDS. And so you could find one foster family, but how do you create a system to, um, to help all the kids? We were, that was the time, Jason, we were recreating orphanages in DC. Mm. You know, that's kind of a third world country answer to, um, to what do you do with children that have no parents. So I got involved um, first, went to law school, and then got involved in politics and really became motivated to create systemic change in Washington. Mm. So when you're working with the children, I was going to go here anyway, but we're going to go there right now. When you're working with the children and you see it in the, in the way in which you saw it, is it heartbreaking? I mean, well, it's interesting. I, um, my career trajectory, it was more heartbreaking when I was on the city council afterwards, oversight of the agency that I had started off in in the city. Because when you're in it, you can do something. You know, if there's a, a child or a family that's in trouble, you're the one that's out there getting to know them and helping intervene. It's, you know, people often say, oh, you're a social worker, you, you work with child protection, isn't it heartbreaking? It's not as much when you're part of the solution and you're able to do something. It's um, when I was, um, you know, I, through elected office, became the councilman for Ward 6, but 
right away they, because of my experience, they gave me oversight of human services for the city. And we had some tragic deaths, terrible, terrible deaths in the child welfare system. And that was heartbreaking because I felt like now I'm in the position to where when people say, well, you don't want to fall through the cracks, I was the safety net of saying, this is what we have to do. Or these people have to be held accountable. Or these people, um, you know, you need more money, you need more resources. That was hard. That was mm. very hard. But when you're in it, when you're in the trenches, it's, um, it can be quite gratifying. Yeah. Was it pretty eye-opening for you? Like when, you, when you're in the trenches and you're seeing what you, I can't imagine you come out, um, I just, it's hard to visualize it, like going from not being able to see it and then you're in there and you're seeing children and families in such need. Were you prepared for that? Well, you know, there's some things that were, um, that when you're in it, you know that this isn't right, but you're in it to, um, you know, it becomes your daily life. And so DC was also then the murder capital of the country. It was dangerous. And so I would go into some public housing, some multifamily buildings, and have to get up, you know, elevators wouldn't work. I'd go up the stairwells, see a whole lot, pass a lot of um, scary folks that um, were maybe doing things that they didn't want people to see. But because they thought I was either a public defender or from, you know, the foster care system or something, they, would, they gave me safe passage. But I did go to some places where, um, where it was pretty scary and had to do it on a regular basis. And that, you know, crack was, it's a different kind of drug. With crack, people just lose their minds to where crack becomes the most important thing in their lives. When you have heroin addicts or alcoholics, they're not good parents, but they still understand, love, and care about their children. On crack, you lose that bond. So moms would go into the hospital deliver a child, leave, and never go back. That's, you know, we had not experienced mm. that before. That complete disconnect mm -hmm. to being a parent. And, you know, it was a violent time in the city. That's, you know, just a couple blocks from over there is where we had Rayful Edmond. And, you know, he, they made movies about Rayful Edmond. He's still in prison. Um, and we had, um, you know, the whole thing about drug kingpins, street corners all around here were um, controlled by different drug groups. Um, I visited houses here and helped children and families that were in trouble, but it was, um, it was dangerous. It was very dangerous. It's a very different place around here now. Mm. And in large part, thanks to you and what you've done well, thank in your you. time. So that's, thank you. that's great. So you go from child services to ANC to city council. Um, Talk about the jump in the transition for you and, and what that looked like. Well, that, that's good. I was an advisory neighborhood commissioner for three terms. And during that time when the city was really struggling, and we didn't have cell phones, but we had pagers. And neighborhoods wanted um, pay phones taken out of their community. They wanted park benches taken out of their community. They wanted bus shelters taken out of the community because they were viewed as being places where people would use them somewhere in the drug trade, either for getting out of the weather in a bus shelter and then selling out of the bus shelter or the benches because of the homeless problems. Um, people were worried about that or the pagers. That's what the, the, um, the pay phones were for. And so that was interesting and I realized that I did not run for office to remove public infrastructure that we had evolved to saying this is part of what a civil society has. So I developed community meetings around we're not going to remove any more public infrastructure. We're going to protect it. We're going to work with our neighbors. We're going to work with the community, whatever the issues are, but we're not going to dismantle the public realm. Mm -hmm. And then um, from my experience working with youth and um, starting to think government was okay, I ran for school board. And that was the time when the school board was half appointed and half elected. So I ran and won for wards five and six. We have eight wards, so I represented one quarter of the city. And that was an interesting process of running for school board. And here is whoever gets the most votes wins. I ran in a field of eight. Um, people didn't know me that well, and I won with 23% of the vote. Wow. And then I was reelected on school board. And that, again, the school system was really in terrible shape. 
And so we started trying to rebuild the school system, but it was really known by nepotism. You know, on, in the area where I live on, on Capitol Hill, the junior high uh, principal, his sister was the elementary school principal, her husband was the other elementary school principal. It was the nepotism and the lack of accountability. Not that these were bad people, they're great people. But it just got to be where the system was somewhat atrophied and um, people kind of protecting the status quo. So when I went on to the, the um, city council, first thing I did is work with the mayor, Adrian Fenty, to take responsibility for the school system, put it under the mayor directly. And they hired Michelle Ree, and the rest is history. How does your brain work? And that, that's a question, I'll tell you where I'm going with that. You see a problem, you come up with the solution, and, 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 and I admire folks that, that go through their entire career trying to solve citywide problems, whether it be drugs or, or the Anacostia River, or different problems. How do you think? Like, do you think, okay, I can make a difference here, so I'm going to go there. How does Tommy Wells think? Well, I appreciate that question because that's part of what I bring to the table is I, I think very strategically that, um, you know, one of the bills that I'm known for is the plastic bag five cent fee. And I had, my wife and I had taken a trip to Switzerland and I saw how incredibly pristine Switzerland is. And their rivers, their waterways were all very clean. And I thought, well, you know, before I finish my first term on the council, I need to do something for the environment. You know, my ward is a good bit of it abuts the Anacostia River. So at the time, it seemed that one of the things that people are most sensitized to were these disposable plastic bags. You saw them blowing up against fences, they're in trees. They became ubiquitous in our environment. And once you start thinking, wait a minute, this is a problem, then you see them everywhere. Like I. I could not see all the plastic bags blowing around in the what community. What you focus on matters. Yes. And so um, I thought, how do you, um, how do you pass one of these? Because, for example, bottle deposit bills, one has not been passed in over 30, almost 35 years. The opponents have gotten very good at stopping these things. So I approached it very strategically. And I thought about how do you do this? And so I brought in the opponents or projected who the opponents would be and who were for bottle, opponents to bottle bills. So I brought in the grocery stores, brought in Harris Teeter, brought in folks from across the country, Safeway, and talked to them about the role of bags in their, their work. And um, really learned as much as I could about the issue, learned what they would be concerned about. They didn't want to be, they viewed bags as a customer courtesy to enhance customer experience. But bags cost them money. At that time, the plastic bag cost two cents, and on every dollar that they make at their grocery store, um, or every dollar they in business, they get three cents profit. So the two cents in small purchases really made a difference. So I spent a lot of time working through a bill that would work understanding the role of bags, and then I researched across the country, how do they defeat these things? And I realized that it's more important not to raise money it's important to get in people's heads. Someone to say, hey Jason, do you need a bag with that? Otherwise, you know, you buy batteries for a camera or something and you, you, they put it in a bag, they hand it to you, you throw the bag away, you open them and get your batteries out. I mean, that bag was part of the transaction. How do we get someone in between there? Yeah. So I did that and then I knew people would be worried about the five cents. Like, oh, there's just no way for government to get in your pocket. So. I made a nexus to the cleaning up the Anacostia River, which is a pain point for the city because it kind of, it for a while has represented the other side of the tracks. Like which side do you live on the Anacostia River? It's an issue of, of, um, of equity and race. And so the bill was called the Anacostia River Cleanup Initiative. And whenever I debated it, I would say, what's the name of the bill? And eventually they'd say, look, I want to clean up the river, just not this way. And so really got people focused on what the whole thing was about. And so there was, the, the bill passed by a unanimous vote on the council and nobody has ever run in the past 10 years, it's the 10 year anniversary of that bill, nobody's ever run to repeal the bag tea, bag tax, bag fee, whatever you want to call it. And so um, that's really part of how I view 
the world is how do you interact in a strategic way that assures success? Mm -hmm. And how do you see clearly in the distance either what's going to get in your way or if it's a failed operation so that you can recalibrate quickly? Mm -hmm. So um, that's a great question that that has been kind of the hallmark of what I do is how do you work strategically to assure that you achieve goals? Mm. Even though the future is unrecognizable, you have to accept that space so that you can't control the future so that when things happen, you're not completely thrown off. Just accept the future is unrecognizable, but you can interact strategically with your goals to achieve them. And it's just a matter of looking as far down the road as you can. When you look back on your career as a whole, is th do you have well, moments that you say, that's one of my favorite, favorite moments? Is it, is it the, the initiative, the plastic bag we just talked about? Is that one of your favorites? I enjoyed that. I also, um, when, I, when I left the, um, the government and child protection, I ran an association that worked with all the nonprofits in the city to, um, to rebuild the child welfare system. And I felt responsible to do that because I helped lead a class action lawsuit against the city, a successful one, to say, you violated almost all the laws designed to protect kids. And so you lose the city and you're gonna go under receivership in the federal court. And so it did. But then I felt responsible to help rebuild, like what would a great child welfare system look like? Mm -hmm. And um, I decided our court is a court of general, juris juris general jurisdiction. 59 judges at the time, all appointed by the president. And the lowest attorney on the totem pole is any attorney that had experience in child welfare and family law and juvenile law. So they never got appointed to the court. And then they would um, be put on the family calendar to learn how to be a judge. And as soon as after six months or a year, they'd put them somewhere else in the courthouse. So there was no priority for children and families and people that really didn't like doing it and didn't know anything about it. So I worked with a gentleman, um, a retired gentleman from the Congressional Research Service, a guy named Bob Gutman. And we came up with a bill to create a family court in D.C. And the court was all opposed to it. They said, oh, it's going to be a kiddie court, a secondary court. No one's going to want to serve on the kiddie court. And the American Bar Association, the local chapter, said this is a terrible idea. We don't want a separate court. We're a great court because the president appoints us and we're a court of general jurisdiction. So bad news is we had a terrible tragedy of a kid in foster care being killed by by his mom. And I got a call from Tom DeLay's office, who at the time was the majority whip, and he was called the hammer. But he also had been a foster parent. And his staff said, the congressman wants to do something. Um, what can we do? And I said, well, I have this bill to um, create a family court in D.C. And so they took it, and there's a hearing. And the hearing was me and the bar association there saying this is a terrible idea. It was kind of fun to go up against these institutions and the bill passed. And the number of children that w had been adopted out of foster care, which is a court process, before that bill passed was the highest number ever had been 64 children in a year. After that bill went over to 300 children wow. getting permanent homes. Wow. And the um, court was an award-winning court and it's a prestige if you're a judge in D.C. Family Court. And so you, sir, you, when you get put on that bench, you have to agree to be there for at least five years. Many of those judges have to be re up for another five. Otherwise, they can go into the regular court. It's great prestige. Um, that's one of those things I look at to say that that was one of those cogs in a, we in a machine that changed the whole machine. I'm most proud of that in terms of just changing the trajectory of um, children and families that need our help um, by creating a family court in Washington. As I listen, I, I just, I'm taken back by when I ask questions, you know, about you, what are you most proud of? Um, you're very humble, you're very strategic, and you're a long-term thinker is what, what hits me. And that's kind of, that's very, very impressive. How did you, how did you get there mentally? I, I want to I dive a little bit deeper with you. And you bring it across in such a way that's so natural, your, your ability to, to do the things I just mentioned. 
But growing up as a kid, what, what was your background like? How, how did you become the person you are today that sees a problem, takes action, and moves forward? I think that, um, I mean, that's a great question, Jason. Like, how do we become who we are? I think that, um, you know, I grew up, I, I wasn't old enough to be drafted into Vietnam, but I was old enough to watch incredible things happen and see it, not understand it, but I remember watching when, you know, RFK was shot and when Martin Luther King was assassinated. And then I think one of the things that affected me the most was watching the, the students at Kent State get shot by other young people in the National Guard. That, and then seeing the Watergate hearings. So I started off with this idea that you can't just assume all the institutions are right. You know, whether it be the church, your government, even at times your parents. I started off with watching these incredible challenges to the institutions of what makes up our country. And I was a little distrustful. And um, I think through the process of starting with a healthy skepticism of, you know, question authority, <coughs> mean more than a slogan but for whatever reason the kids I grew up with also you know I, I was probably a little mouthy but um, they often viewed me as a leader like what are you gonna do about this and so somewhere along the way I started feeling like I had the responsibility to do something um, I did it in our neighborhood with the kids I grew up with and as I moved on in life, um, you know, I became more and more aware that I had been born, you know, I was raised by a, you know, a single mom and, and all that who had not gone to college and all that, but I still had privilege. You know, I grew up in the South as a white male, went to college, and became more and more aware that, um, that I, I accomplished some things but I had a much easier road than others and that gave me a greater responsibility. Like, what are you gonna do with it? You know, if you're, by no fault of my own and no achievement of my own, I was born, you know, a white guy with no, you know, general disabilities in America, the most prosperous country in the world with the greatest power in the world and, um, and felt more and more as time went on that I had a responsibility to not take that for granted. How do I use that in a way that I can be proud at the end of the day or at the end of my life? Can I say, um, I didn't take it for granted. Mm -hmm. I, I did something with that privilege. And so it's, um, so there's that. And then also I do really, I mean, there, one of the reasons I went to social work is I like to understand how human systems work. Like, why do things happen the way they do? Why, why do things turn into a riot? Why do things, you know, I, I remember, I think I was early college, but I remember when Lech Walesa was doing what he was doing to take over um, Poland. And, um, and it was like, how did that happen? Is, you know, it's, it's a point in time. It's, you know, the right person. I have always been um, kind of, interested in how society changes and moves and what, mm -hmm. what does it, what impacts it. So there's the personal interest of how do we work, you know, how does the society work. I, I remember, um, <coughs> you're way too young for this, but I would come home sometimes being out late with friends when I was in high school and I would turn on Johnny Carson. That's what you watched at night. And I came home and um, you know, I don't know if I had some beers, whatever, and I turned on Johnny Carson down, you know, I was at the age where I made my room the basement, you know, just to have my space. Turned it on, and it was a blank screen. So Johnny was talking, and somebody else was talking, and I was like, ah, there's something wrong with my TV. And then a thing scrolled across that said, there's nothing wrong with your TV. Just because of what's going on right now, we cannot show you the picture. And I thought, well, that's interesting. What's going on? And so by the time the person left, Johnny Carson said, well, that was Ab Abby Hoffman. And as you know, we couldn't show the picture to you because 
He was wearing a shirt made out of the American flag. And I thought, wow, by what shirt Abby Hoffman put on? He got an interview, but he shut, turned all the screens in America that are watching Johnny Carson, the majority of anybody that's watching TV, he turned them black. And I thought, that's power. Mm. And so I think by observing what happens and what, um, you know, what makes a movement, the, the plastic bag. I chose the plastic bag because I saw in Ireland, they just did a, a 20 cent fee on plastic bags. It was, the, it was the issue that was starting to come up to a crest. And so people are starting to think more and more about, you know, I, I had my reusable bags, but I left them at home or I left them in the trunk. Too hard to go back and get. It was, that was the right issue at the time. And so the plastic bag fee was really about following that crest of a wave of interest that people want to be responsible in the environment. And I can't say that I always am able to tell you what that wave is, but um, being look, looking at the trends to see how society's moving and then seeing what's successful or not is part of being strategic and how you make change. Mm. Fascinating. Is there anything you look back on and say, boy, that was a mistake? Oh, yeah. <laughs> of course. What comes to mind right <coughs> away when I say that? Well... You know, there's things as, as simple as, you know, I, w I wish I'd done better in college. Like, who doesn't? But <laughs> exactly. Um, I put a lot of the mistakes out of my mind. But now and then, um, you know, through human um, interactions, um, there's, you know, I'm reaching an age where my mentors and people that I know that had a big influence in my life are starting to die. And so I routinely think, wow, I wish I had spent more time with them. I wish I had checked in with them and let them check in with me because we did some important stuff together mm -hmm. and they um, had an impact on my life and I need to be sure they knew that, that they had had an impact on my life. So I think the regrets, I, I do my best to live without regrets, but mistakes often have to do with um, things unsaid words unspoken and you know relationships I didn't check back in on that um, I, I kind of wish I had. Mm. I feel like we could do a uh, five or six part series and we could focus on DC and how Tommy thinks and, and different components but let's have a little bit of fun and, and talk about some of the things you're working on now. I did not know um, guilty of not knowing that the DC has its own uh, fish What's the fish of D.C.? So <clears throat> when I, um, the mayor asked, like, well, as you know, I ran against the mayor. Right. I, I ran for, against the mayor. And for the first time, and this says a lot about Muriel Bowser, she, after she won, she said, hey, Tommy, why don't you join my cabinet? And, um, and no council member ever done that before. And so I said, okay. And to all the viewers, your life is a job interview. I had never thought I'd be the director of the Department of Energy and the Environment. That, I mean, you just heard a long history that did not ever say, <coughs> you know, and then I rescued rabbits. Yeah. Um, so because of, you know, just kind of living your own ethos, people say, oh, yeah, that, you ought to make them the Department of the, you know, Environment. And that's what it was at the time. There wasn't energy in it. And so after I, she offered it, I said, sure, I'll do that. So I told friends, I said, I'm the director of the Department of the Environment. And usually the response is, we have a Department of the Environment? And so I realized I needed to put it on the map. And we've got, you know, 350, now 450 staff that are in charge of our environment and our energy world. And so I um, wanted people to start becoming aware that there is that because then you know, someone goes home and they can say, you know, I work for a Department of Now Energy and Environment. And people say, oh, yeah, I saw, you know, something on TV or that was interesting. So the first thing, obviously, I knew what we'd have to have is we had to have a mascot. So I challenged staff, we need to have a mascot. And I have a very creative um, leader of my Office of communica Communications. And she figured out, you know what, I think it's going to be a fish and it's gonna be a shad. Because we passed an initiative that made the American shad the state fish of Washington, D.C. 
So um, they got a costume, specially made. You know, it's a big shad. <laughs> the it, shad. It the dances. Shad the shad was in the president's race. The shad has um, makes appearances around the city, and I think that um, what's been fun is to kind of reintroduce people that this is your Department of Energy and Environment. I know, um, for example, we promote where we put um, um, webcams for eagles that are nesting in um, the Arboretum around our fifth generation, <coughs> which is important because part of what I'm doing is cleaning up the Anacostia River. Mm -hmm. These eagles, they live completely off the Anacostia River. <coughs> there was a time when there were no eagles for over 50 years in D.C. So that's been fun, but we've got two cameras on them. They're infrared, they're mic'd 24 hours a day. You wanna know what's going on with the Eagles? It's a way to reconnect people to the environment. And where can they, where can <coughs> they go? Somebody's watching right now, they wanna go well, check in Well, just on put DC Eagles webcam, and there's two of them. We've got one um, down in farther southeast as well. Okay. So these, it's fun to kind of get people reconnect to nature and there's a whole new kind of feeling about what nature is in a city. Cities used to try to get nature out. Now people are part of bringing nature in. It used to be that if you had bats in your eaves, you'd call animal control. Now people call us and say, where can I get a bat box to put on the side of my house? Because we want bats around here because they deal with mosquitoes. Yeah. It's a whole different ethos. And that's um, been kind of fun um, at the Department of Energy and the Environment. So we're planting trees like mad. We're, as I said, we're cleaning up the river. We're, um, we're deploying, we've got one of the largest solar deployments for any city in the country where almost all the benefits of the solar we deploy go to helping cut power bills for low-income residents. Mm. And that's, that's been like a Rubik's Cube. How do I generate solar on, it, say, on warehouses over here? and cut the power bills for people over here and how do you monetize or turn into credits that's been interesting we're putting out between 10 million and 30 million a year just deploying solar and giving the benefits to low, benefits to low income residents so some of the things that we're working on you know we were named um, last year we were named the first lead platinum city in the world i mean dc is leading the world in a lot of ways and we have to because the federal government is sat down. They're not on the playing field anymore around climate change, on the environment. And so that puts DC in a leadership role. Um, you know, I was at COP21 in Paris <clears throat> with other cities making commitments of how we're going to be carbon neutral by 2050. We're gonna um, you know, cut our, our, our greenhouse gas emissions by 50% um, by 2032. So that the, I'm, I'm disturbed as much as the next person about climate change, but I've been given the gift of being able to do something, at least our part, about it. And we've positioned DC to be the leader of the world in so many ways, even though we're still continuing to learn from each other. There's a lot to learn, but you know, I um, have a fun job, but it's, it's a way that I can also feel like I'm making a difference. Mm -hmm. And I think also, um, you know, part of my job, first thing I did is I got the, the executive director's canoe and put it down by the Anacostia River. And I'll take you. I'd love to take you. Let's I go. take people up the Anacostia River, point out the flora and the fauna, and, and you get up further on the Anacostia River, and it's like the land that time forgot. These big birds flying over you, the, the herons and the egrets, and you're up by the Arboretum on one side, and the... Um, the Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens and the other, you might as well be like in the Okefenokee. It's um, beaver swimming by. Oh, nice. It's fabulous. And so I do that. I take important people like you up the river. I'm to highly important. To see what we've got. And so that you feel good about, yeah, we, we've got to protect this. We have to promote our, our environment. And um, D.C. has got a very interesting environment. Oh, that's fascinating. That's fa So there it is. You can hear it, like the episodes evolving as we talk. I definitely want to do that, and we, we should create a whole other show around that. Do well, that'd another be great. Episode, episode with that. Who paddles, you or me or both? Or how does I'm in back because okay. I'm a control freak, okay. and so that's where you steer from. Yep. But then you don't know whether I'm paddling or not, 
So you may end up being the motor and don't even realize it. <laughs> so, you know, I have my system and, and it works. Well, that's great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for being on the show. You've been a treat to speak with, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful for all that you've done for the city. Well, Jason, thank you. And just so the viewers know um, a little bit more about you, on the basketball court, this guy is a stud. I mean, you have found the three-point range. You're a killer. You end games. And almost everybody but me is younger than this guy, and nobody lets this guy go unguarded. He is a stud on the basketball court. My head's going like this, and, and I can't wait to share this with and my so, wife. So that's why I'm here is out of respect. And maybe you can give me a little, you know, maybe you'll pass me the ball or something like that. Not that you need to, because you are a scorer. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to end it on that. Mr. Tommy Wells, thanks for coming on the show.